So today on the guard, today we're going to be solving May June 2021 variant 2 paper 1. Let's begin. Number 1. Which row describes the membrane surrounding each cell structure? Fluoroplast. We all know it's going to be a double membrane. Mitochondrion. Same, it's also a double membrane structure. Nucleus. We know it has a double membrane too. A nuclear envelope. So the answer is going to be C. The width of a mitochondria in an electron micrograph is 6 mm. The magnification of the electron micrograph is 9600 magnification. What is the actual mean width of the mitochondria? First of all, let's draw the equation for magnification. It is I m. And here we want the actual width. Therefore, we have to divide the image size by magnification, giving us B. Which sequence shows the correct order of some of the stages in the production and secretion of an enzyme? A. Golgi body, then ribosome. This is incorrect because the polypeptide has to be first synthesized in the rough endoplasmic reticulum or ribosome, then it moves to the Golgi body to be modified and packaged, so this is incorrect. B. mRNA, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi body. This is incorrect because Enzymes, which is a polypeptide or a protein, is actually synthesized in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Steroid. Ribosome, rough endoplasmic reticulum, vesicle, and Golgi body. This order seems to be correct because the polypeptide is synthesized in the ribosome. It's moved through the rough endoplasmic reticulum and then packaged into a vesicle, which there goes to the Golgi body to be modified and packaged. So the answer is going to be C. Different antibiotics function in different ways. Ideally, the antibiotic kills the bacteria, but does not harm the infected human. One type of antibiotic, tetracycline, can affect the way in which human mitochondria function. What explains the effect of tetracycline on human mitochondria? 1. The antibiotic prevents the synthesis of peptidoglycan cell walls. This is incorrect because here it's mentioning human mitochondria, and human mitochondria does not have cell walls. 2. The antibiotic prevents the synthesis of linear DNA. This is incorrect. It does not have effect on mitochondria because linear DNA is found in the nucleus of the cell, and circular DNA is what is found in the mitochondria. Three, the antibiotic prevents translation by binding to 70S ribosomes. This is the only correct answer because mitochondria has 70S ribosomes and the cytoplasm has normal 80S ribosomes. So the answer is going to be D. Five, a, prokary five, a prokaryotic cell is 5 micrometers in length. A virus particle is 300 nanometers in length. How many times larger is the prokaryotic cell compared to the virus particle? First of all, we have to convert both of these into the same unit. In this case, I'm going to be converting from micrometers to nanometers by multiplying by a thousand, giving us 5,000 nanometers. Then we divide 5,000 nanometers by 300 nanometers. Gives us 16.6. Rounding, it's going to give us 17, so the answer is going to be B. 6. A student carries out a semi-quantitative test with Benedict's solution. Benedict's solution is basically used to identify the presence of a reducing sugar. And a semi-quantitative test is actually finding the quantity of reducing sugar. In this case, we know that the higher concentration of reducing sugar, the more red the solution turns, and if it has a low concentration of reducing sugar, the solution might be either green or yellow. So it almost can be used to measure the quantity of reducing sugar, but not accurately. A. It detects only the presence or absence of glucose. In this case, it's not semi-quantitative, so this is incorrect. B. It provides an indication of the relative reducing sugar concentration. As we mentioned, the color represents the concentration of the reducing sugar, so this is correct. 
see the precipitate needs to be filtered, dried and weighed to give the reducing sugar concentration. This is incorrect. D. A colorimeter needs to be used to determine the glucose concentration. This is incorrect. It actually determines the absorption of color. Therefore, the correct answer is going to be B. 7. Which row is correct for carbohydrates? Macromolecule, sucrose, no this is incorrect, sucrose is a disaccharide. Glycogen, glycogen is correct because it's made up of many alpha-glucose monomers. Alpha-glucose is a monomer, it's not a macromolecule so this is incorrect. Same with starch, it's a macromolecule because it's made of many repeating units of alpha-glucose forming amylose and amylopectin. So this is correct. Monomer, it's not a starch, as we said it's a polymer. Sucrose is not a monomer. Glycogen is a macromolecule, so this is incorrect. And alpha-glucose is a monomer, so the answer is going to be D. 8. Which shows the correct general formula of glycogen? As we all know, glycogen is made up of many units of alpha-glucose formed by a condensation reaction. So as we know, a condensation reaction forms a molecule of water. And we know the equation of glucose is C6H12O6. So what do we do is we subtract the water from the formula. This gives us C6H10 because we subtracted the two hydrogens O5 because we subtracted the one oxygen from the water molecule formed. So the answer is going to be C9. Chitin is a structural polysaccharide found in the hard outer shells of animals such as crabs. Chitin is made of chains of amino sugars that contain NH groups. The diagram shows the two sugars in the chain of a chitin molecule. Which polysaccharide is most like chitin? The first observation that we should make here is that the second molecule is actually rotated 180 degrees. As we all know, the polysaccharide that has its monomer, second monomer rotated 180 degrees is definitely going to be cellulose and it's made up of many beta-glucose monomers. So the answer is going to be C. Number 10. Four fatty acids and their formula are listed. Which fatty acids are unsaturated? So first of all, here we could see two double bonds. So we know that this is going to be both of them unsaturated. Therefore, we know that these are going to be incorrect. Now we have to check that these two are also saturated or unsaturated. So here we have a general formula. CN H2N. This is the formula for unsaturated fatty acids. So if you multiply the number of carbon atoms in the formula by 2, it's going to give you 2N. Here this is not the case. If we multiply the number of carbon atoms here by 2, it's going to give you 12 and it's not the same number. So the answer is going to be A. Question number 11, which molecule contains the smallest number of hydrogen atoms? Here, you actually have to use your common sense. As we know that alpha glucose, the formula of glucose is C6H12O6, so it's going to have 12 hydrogen atoms. In case of glycine, we know that glycine is the most simple amino acid. And here, drawing the formula, we know that it's going to have 5 hydrogens. C. Glycerol. We know for common sense that glycerol forms a condensation reaction with three fatty acids to form a triglyceride, so it must have three hydroxyl groups, as you see here. So it definitely has a lot of hydrogen atoms. D. A saturated fatty acid containing eight carbon atoms, here we drew them, is definitely a lot of hydrogen atoms. Therefore, the most appropriate answer is going to be glycine, which is B. 12. The diagram shows sucrose and sucralose. 
The enzyme sucrase breaks down sucrose but cannot break down sucralose. For students who are asked to suggest why sucrase can break down sucrose but not sucralose, three of the students gave the correct suggestions. Which suggestion cannot be correct? So we were looking here for the incorrect suggestion. For A, the Cl atoms change the shape of the sucralose molecule so it is not the same shape as the active site of sucrase. Here, mentioning same shape is totally incorrect. The reason for this is because the sucralose molecule is complementary to the enzyme. It's not the same shape as the enzyme. For example, if the enzyme looks like this, it is complementary. It's not the same shape, so this must be incorrect. Let's look at the other suggestions. The chlorine atoms of the modified fructose cannot bind to the active site of sucrase. Actually, we cannot decide in this case whether it's correct or incorrect because here we don't know the type of interactions or bonds which have been altered or changed between the substrate and the enzyme. So in this case, we cannot decide. C. The chlorine atoms cannot cause an induced fit, so sucralose does not enter the active site of sucrase. This actually might be correct because Induced fit works when the enzyme interacts with the active site via specific bond interactions. Therefore, these interactions cause the enzyme to mold around the substrate becoming complementary, even if the substrate is not actually complementary. Therefore, this is correct. D. The Cl atoms cause fewer temporary hydrogen bonds between sucralose and the active site of sucrase. This is actually correct because the chlorine atoms, as we can see here, has replaced the hydroxyl groups. Therefore, there's going to be fewer hydrogen bonding. So this is correct. So the only incorrect answer is going to be A. It shows the energy levels involved in an enzyme catalyzed reaction. Substrate molecules X and Y combine to give product Z, which arrow shows the reduction in activation energy due to the enzyme. So a rule that we all must know is this, all of this represents the activation energy. And we all know that enzyme cause a reduction in that activation energy by providing an alternative pathway for the substrate. Therefore, and here it's asking for the reduction. So the answer is going to be B because the activation energy has decreased here and this is the reduction. Question number 14. Which roles of the cell surface membrane result from the properties of phospholipids? 1. To allow cytokinesis to occur in mitotic cell division. This is correct because in cytokinesis, the cell wall almost constricts and two cells are formed. 2. To allow entry and exit of oxygen and carbon dioxide. This is correct because it has a hydrophobic core. This hydrophobic core allows hydrophobic molecules to be able to pass through the cell surface membrane, like oxygen and carbon dioxide, so this is correct. We to allow phagocytosis of a bacterium into the cell. Phagocytosis occurs when a bacterium, for example, interacts with the cell surface membrane, then a vesicle it fuses first with the cell surface membrane and a vesicle is formed. A vesicle cannot be formed without the properties of phospholipids. Because phospholipids, as we all know, it has a hydrophilic and both a hydrophobic port, so it can form a vesicle as we just said. So the answer is going to be A. Factors can be changed to affect the rate of facilitated diffusion across the cell surface membrane. 1. The surface area of the membrane. This is correct because as the surface area increases, this provides more space for transport proteins responsible for that facilitated diffusion because facilitated diffusion is movement of substances through transport proteins. And we could see this example in mitochondria, which has a folded cristae. Two, the concentration gradient. In any diffusion, this is correct, the higher the concentration gradient, the more faster the rate of diffusion. 3. The number of specific protein channels, as we mentioned, coming back to the first point, this is correct. The more protein channels available, the more molecules it is able to pass through it. 
So this is correct, the answer is going to be A. It was an experiment using a model cell to investigate the movement of substances. Which statements are correct? One, there's a net movement of sucrose out of the model cell. Here, coming back to the diagram, it says membrane permeable to monosaccharides and water. Sucrose is a disaccharide, not a monosaccharide. The monosaccharide here is only glucose. So glucose is the substance that moves, not sucrose, so this is incorrect. Two, there's a net movement of glucose out of the model cell. As we said, the membrane is permeable to monosaccharides. So let's here see the concentrations. Outside, there's a 0.01 concentration of glucose, and inside, we could see a 0.02 concentration. So, glucose moves out of the cell down concentration gradient. So this is correct. Three, there is a net movement of water into the model cell. This is correct because inside the cell, we have a higher concentration of sucrose and glucose. So there, this means that there is a lower water potential. And outside, there is a higher water potential. So water goes into the model cell by osmosis down water potential gradient. So the answer is going to be D. Ozones have different parts. Some parts are more numerous than others. Which parts are listed in order from the most numerous to the least numerous in a human white blood cell? By meaning the most numerous and least numerous, the most numbers. So as we all know, for example, histone proteins has the largest numbers. There are thousands and thousands of histone proteins in a single DNA molecule. So let's see the suggestions we have here. A. Centromere, nucleotide, and histone protein. Centromere, we only know that we have just one centromere in a single chromosome. And nucleotides, we know we have thousands and thousands of nucleotides, same with histone proteins. So this is the least numerous, not the most. So this is incorrect. B, DNA molecule, telomere, centromere. We know in a single chromosome, we have two DNA molecules, one in each chromatid. And telomere, we know we have two telomeres at the end of each chromatid. Therefore, a total of four telomeres per chromosome. And here with the centromere, as we said earlier, there's only one centromere. So this is incorrect. See, histone proteins, as we said, we have thousands. Telomere, we have four. DNA molecule, we have two. So this is the correct answer. It presents the cell cycle of a human cell. During the cell cycle, the number of chromatids changes. Which row is correct for the number of chromatids in M, G1, and G2? As we all know, the first point here is we know that S phase is where DNA replication takes place. Therefore, the number of DNA after this phase up until cytokinesis, where it splits again, is going to be doubled. So let's see the suggestions we have here. In M, as we said, it's going to be doubled, so it's going to be 92. And for G1, we just said when cytokinesis happens, the DNA halves, becoming the original number, so it's going to be 46. And for G2, this is the phase after DNA replication, so after the DNA has doubled, so it's going to be 92. The answer is going to be C. A single skin cell was isolated and transferred to growth medium in a sterile petri dish. The petri dish was incubated for 16 days. Let's just skip all this and read. What was the total number of telomere bases in the chromosome from the cell that has undergone the most mitotic divisions? By all this wording, he's just trying to confuse you. It says, how many telomeres in the cell that has undergone the most mitotic divisions? We know that with each division, let me write that, with each division, number of telomere bases decreases. So the cell that has undergone the most mitotic divisions is going to have the lowest number of telomeres. The lowest number here we have is going to be A. Third piece of DNA, 18 base pairs long, 
was analyzed to find the number of nucleotide bases in each of the purely nucleotide strands. Some of the results are shown in the table, how many nucleotides containing thymine were present in strand 2. As we all know that DNA bases are joined together or pairs together by complementary base pairing rule. So for example, if adenine, it has to pair with thymine. Coming back to the question, we know that thymine here is 7, so in strand 2, the adenine is also going to be 7. For strand 1, we know that cytosine is going to be 4, so also guanine in strand number 2 has to be 4. As we all know here, in the question it says, a short piece of DNA is 18 base pairs long, so each strand is going to have 18 base pairs. Therefore, if we add all the numbers on strand number 2, 7 plus 5 plus 4, and then 18 minus that answer is going to give us 2 for thymine number 2. If we know that it has 5 cytosines, so in strand number 1 it's also going to have 5 guanines. If we add up 4 plus 5 plus 7 it's also and subtract 18, it's also going to give us 2. So here it says how many nucleotides containing thymine were present in strand number 2. In this case, is going to be A. The diagram shows a strand of DNA and mRNA during transcription, which row correctly identifies 1, 2, and 3. 1 is a purine, no, actually, cytosine and thymines are pyrimidines. And these are single ringed structures. On the other hand, spurine are adenine and guanine, and these are double ring structures. So these are incorrect and it's going to be pyrimidine. We decide yet because it's here, it's not showing any uracil, so we cannot decide. Let's move on to three. It's either two hydrogen bonds or three hydrogen bonds. Here we have guanine and cytosine. And we all know it's a general rule that guanine binds to cytosine via three hydrogen bonds and adenine binds to thymine via two hydrogen bonds. So we all know the answer is going to be three hydrogen bonds, therefore two must be ribose, so the answer is going to be D. 22. Two students were discussing the involvement of DNA and RNA in transcription and translation. Student 1 always stated correct facts. Student 2 gave further information, which was sometimes correct. Which further information given by student 2 is correct? Let's start with the first one. A length of mRNA is 747 nucleotides long, including stop and start codons. Further information is this mRNA can produce a polypeptide that is 249 amino acids wrong. In this case, this is incorrect because as we know that three nucleotides codes for one amino acid. So if we divide 747 by three, it's going to give us exactly 249. The issue is here it's mentioning stop and start codons. Therefore, it will be way less than 249 not exactly 249, so this is incorrect. 2. Adjacent mRNA codons of A, A, U, and C, U, G bind to complementary tRNA anticodons. Okay, this is correct. There's a total of 14 hydrogen bonds formed between these two codons and their anticodons. There, this is correct. Let's draw them out here. A, A. We know that adenine binds with thymine with two hydrogen bonds. Same here too. And we know that cytosine binds with guanine via three hydrogen bonds. So if we count these and add them up, it's going to be 14. So this is correct. 
RNA polymerase catalyzes the formation of mRNA from template st strand of DNA. This is correct. Let's see the next one. During translation, an RNA adenine nucleotide will pair with DNA thymine nucleotide. This is incorrect because it's not during translation, it's during transcription where an mRNA strand is formed. So this is incorrect. For a DNA adenine nucleotide is structurally different to an RNA adenine nucleotide. This is correct because DNA adenine nucleotide has deoxyribose sugar while RNA has only a ribose sugar. The next one is the difference is in the hexose sugar. Hexose is incorrect because ribose and deoxyribose are pentose sugars. So this is incorrect. The only correct answer is going to be C3. Which descriptions of the adaptations of xylem vessel elements to their function are correct? 1. They have pits between vessels, allowing water to pass from one vessel to another. This is correct. They do have pits to allow water movement. Also, the pit function is to allow the lateral air bubble movement outside the xylem vessel elements because air bubbles could slow down the process of transpiration by disrupting cohesion. So this is correct. Two, they are thickened with lignin to stop them collapsing when the column of water is under tension. This is correct because as we know, xylem vessel elements are lignified to provide structural support, etc. Three, they form a continuous hollow tube through the plant providing little resistance to water movement. This is correct because it's a continuous tube. There are no end walls for resistance. So therefore, there's a continuous column. So this is correct. So the answer is going to be A. 24. The diameter of a tree trunk usually decreases slightly during the day. Which changes in the environment factors during the day could cause the diameter to decrease even more? First of all, let's break up the question. What does it mean when the diameter decreases slightly? This means that the rate of transpiration increases. The reason for that is when the diameter of the trunk decreases, this is because of increased cohesive forces between water molecules. This causes the trunk to move in inwards due to tension. Therefore, here we're looking for the factors that increase the rate of transpiration. So as we know, increased humidity, no, it does not increase the rate of transpiration because the higher water potential gradient the transpiration so this is incorrect increased wind speed as we said it increases the concentration gradient correct increased light intensity this allows more water to evaporate from the surface of mesophyll cells and gives water molecules more kinetic energy so it will also increase the rate of transpiration therefore the answer is going to be b the student wanted to find out the rate of transpiration using a potometer as shown. The student was told to work out the value of transpiration using the units millimeter cubed. So this is volume. Meter cubed, which is might be surface area. And hour, which is time. Which measurements would the student need to take? Let's start with A, volume of water in the reservoir. As we all know, the volume of water for both is going to be incorrect because what is it exactly that is used to work out the rate of transpiration is the movement of the air bubble. The more the air bubble moves, the higher the rate of transpiration. Therefore, A and B is going to be incorrect. See, distance air bubble moves, as we mentioned, this is correct. Then. For C is the radius of the capillary tubing and it's measured in millimeter cubed. Time, as we know, per hour, this is correct. And surface area of the leaves, 
we know that we have here meter cubed, so this is also going to be correct. For D, let's check it. Length of the capillary tubing. We don't actually need the length of the capillary tubing, so this is incorrect. So the answer is going to be C. Six implants assimilate such as sucrose are loaded from source cells into sieve tube elements. The assimilates are then transported from source to sink. What is needed to transport sucrose from source cells through the phloem tissue to sink cells? So let's start with water potential gradient. This is incorrect because sucrose is transported by the difference in hydrostatic pressure. not water potential gradient. Let's see here ATP. ATP is definitely needed to load sucrose into companion cells using proton pumps to pump hydrogen ions out. So this is correct. Hydrostatic pressure gradient between source and sink, we just mentioned that. So sucrose moves from higher hydrostatic pressure to lower hydrostatic pressure. The reason for the hydrostatic pressure buildup is because there's, at the source, there's a higher concentration of sucrose. Therefore, water goes in the phloem sieve tube element by osmosis down water potential gradient. Therefore, there's an increased pressure at the source and it moves down to the sink via hydrostatic pressure gradient. So this is also going to be correct. So the answer is going to be C. 27. The sinoatrial node initiates the cardiac cycle. What is the correct order in which the chambers of the heart contract? Let's start with A. Atria and ventricles at the same time. This is incorrect because we have the AVN node, which delays the impulse at a fraction of 0.1 seconds, so the atria contracts first. So this is incorrect. B. Both atria, then both ventricles. This is correct because coming back to the point of the AVN node, the atria must contract first, then the impulse is delayed at a fraction of 0.1 seconds, then both ventricles contract at the same time. So the only answer is going to be B. 28. The graph shows pressure changes in different parts of the heart during a mammalian cardiac cycle. W, X, Y, and Z indicate when a valve opens or closes. Which row is correct? So here we have a general rule. You have to memorize it. It's going to be close, open, close, open. So we have to know which valves close and which valves open, whether it's the semilunar valve or atrioventricular valves. So the valve here, which closes when the ventricle contracts, is definitely going to be the atrioventricular valve. And the valve which opens when the aorta pressure increases is going to be the semilunar valve. Same here, the valve which closes is also going to be the semilunar. And here, the valve which opens is going to be the atrioventricular valve. Now, the reason for this is when the pressure on the ventricle increases, the semilunar valve, there's enough pressure to open it. Therefore, it opens. Then, when the pressure starts to decrease, then it closes. So, the answer is going to be C. 29. What can combine with the heme group of hemoglobin molecule? Oxygen. This is correct, forming oxyhemoglobin. For carbon dioxide, this is going to be incorrect because it actually binds with the globin part of a hemoglobin molecule, not the heme group. And carbon monoxide definitely binds to the heme group, forming carboxy 
hemoglobin. Why? It's because oxygen and carbon monoxide have the same binding site. So the answer is going to be B. What is the main reaction occurring in blood capillaries at the gas exchange surface in a human lung? So let's start with A. Carbonic acid dissociates into carbon dioxide and hydrogen ions. This is incorrect because carbonic acid actually dissociates into bicarbonate ions and hydrogen ions. So this is the first incorrect point. The second incorrect point is that carbonic acid actually dissociates in tissue, not in lungs. In tissue when carbon dioxide concentration is high. So this is totally incorrect. B. Carbonic acid anhydrase converts carbon dioxide into hydrogen carbonate ions. Okay, this happens as we said in tissues only when carbon dioxide concentration is high. So it doesn't happen in lungs, so it's also incorrect. C. Carbon dioxide combines with hemoglobin to form carbamino hemoglobin. This also happens in tissue when carbon dioxide concentration is high, so this is incorrect. D. Carbon dioxide is produced from hydrogen carbonate ions by carbonic anhydrase. This is correct. Carbon dioxide is actually produced for it to be excreted out of the lungs, so this is correct. 31. Which reactions take place in blood that is passing through active tissues? So this contrasts the last question. Here we have one, it's that oxyhemoglobin. Dissociates or forms hemoglobin and oxygen. So this is correct because oxygen is required in tissues and what happens is that carbon dioxide concentration increases forming higher concentration of H plus ions. This H plus ions or hydrogen ions combine with oxyhemoglobin lowering the affinity of oxyhemoglobin to oxygen. Therefore, it oxyhemoglobin combines with hydrogen ions forming hemoglobinic acid and oxygen. As we all know, when carbon dioxide concentration increases in tissue, it forms more carbonic acid, and this carbonic acid dissociates into bicarbonate and H plus ions. So what happens in tissue is that H plus ions combine with oxyhemoglobin, forming hemoglobinic acid, which has a lower affinity to oxygen, so it releases oxygen in tissue. So this is correct. 3. Bicarbonate combines with hydrogen ions forming carbonic acid. No, this actually happens in lungs, not tissue, for carbon dioxide to be excreted out of the lungs. So this is incorrect. For water plus carbon dioxide gives you carbonic acid. This is correct by the action of carbonic anhydrase. Which row shows the tissues that are present in the wall of the trachea and the wall of the bronchus? So let's start with cartilage. We know that both trachea and bronchus have cartilage. Trachea has C-shaped cartilage. And bronchus has irregular blocks of cartilage. So, all these are correct. Now, let's move on to squamous epithelium. The only structure in the lungs that has squamous epithelium is going to be the alveoli. So, C is the only correct answer. For goblet cells, yes, they're ciliated epithelial cells. So goblet cells are definitely going to be present, so the answer is going to be C. In some cases where a person has lung disease, the partial pressure of oxygen in the pulmonary veins is less than the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli. What could explain the difference in the partial pressure of oxygen? In other words, it basically means that less oxygen diffuses into the lungs. Now let's see the suggestions. One. 
A high proportion of alveoli are collapsed and do not have enough alveolar capillaries. This is correct because if there is a high proportion of alveoli which is collapsed, there is less surface area. Therefore, less oxygen diffuses into the lungs, causing a lower partial pressure in the lungs. For two, the partial pressure of oxygen in the pulmonary arteries is lower than the alveolar air. Now, two actually contradicts this question, because if the partial pressure of oxygen in the pulmonary arteries were actually lower than the alveolar air, then oxygen will diffuse into the lungs, but this is not the case here. Actually, it says there is a lower partial pressure of oxygen into the alveoli, so two is incorrect. Three, the rate of diffusion of oxygen from the alveolar air to the surrounding alveolar capillaries is too slow. Yes, coming back to point one, the rate of diffusion is slow, so less oxygen enters, so the answer is going to be C. Four, how many times must a molecule of carbon dioxide pass through a cell surface membrane as it is diffuses from plasma through a cell in the capillary wall into the alveolus? So let's draw them out. Let's assume that this is going to be the alveolus. And we know that the alveolus has squamous epithelium cells, which almost looks like a fried egg. The squamous epithelium cell, the oxygen has to move through the first phospholipid bilayer, then into the second phospholipid bilayer or cell surface membrane. Let's draw this. And then it moves into the capillary, which has a single cell surface membrane. Inside the capillary, there is a red blood cell. Here it says that carbon dioxide moves through a cell in the capillary wall. So let's assume it's going to be a red blood cell. As we all know, a red blood cell has a single surface cell surface membrane for carbon dioxide to move out. Then. The capillary walls have one cell surface membrane and then as we mentioned earlier, the squamous epithelium, the carbon dioxide diffuses through the first cell surface membrane and then exits that squamous epithelium cell through the second. So total we have here one, two at the capillaries, three and four. So the answer is going to be D. 35. Which disease is spread by a vector? A vector is an organism that carries the disease. In this case, A aids HIV, this is incorrect. B cholera, this is also incorrect. It's transmitted by fecal oral route uh, through contaminated water. C malaria, definitely malaria is correct. The reason for this is its insect vector is anophile mosquitoes. So the answer is going to be C. Which statement explains why a one-dose vaccination program for measles has not yet eliminated the disease? A. Many infants under the age of 8 months have passive immunity. This has nothing to do with vaccination because vaccination is actually artificial active immunity, not passive immunity, so this is incorrect. B. Some children need several booster doses to develop full immunity. This is correct. In some cases, booster doses is required and a single dose vaccination does not have an effect, so this might be correct. See, the one dose measles vaccine has a success rate of 93%. If this, this was the case, the disease was going to almost be eradicated. But here it says the disease has not yet the vaccination has not yet eliminated the disease. So this percentage is definitely incorrect. D. The virus does not often change its antibodies. This contradicts the question, because if it didn't change its antibodies, this means it won't mutate, so only one dose is needed. In this case, this is not the case, so this is going to be incorrect, so the answer is going to be B. 7. What has contributed to this increase in antibiotic resistance in bacteria? 1. Increased use of vaccines for animal disease. This is incorrect, because vaccination has nothing to do with antibiotic resistance. Two, mutations in bacterial DNA. This is correct because a certain mutation 
happening in the DNA is able to give a certain type of resistance to bacteria for this antibiotic. So this is correct. Just not completing their antibiotic treatment. Of course, this would give resistance. The reason for this is because not all bacteria are killed the first time. Therefore, some bacteria stay and reproduce. Therefore, it has a higher chance of mutating and a, a mutation taking place. Therefore, resistance happening. So the answer is going to be 213, which is D. 38. What explains why monoclonal antibodies can be used to target cancer cells? A. Cancer cells have different antigens from normal body cells. This is definitely correct because uh, a feature of monoclonal antibodies is that they are specific. And here specificity is shown that cancer cells have different antigens so can be identified from normal body cells. So this is correct. B. Specific cancer drugs can be attached to the monoclonal antibodies. This is correct, but it does not give a reason why it targets only cancer cells. So this is not correct. The type of antigen that binds to a specific antibody. This is incorrect because cancer cells do not secrete antigens. They have antigens on their cell surface membrane, but they don't secrete it. D. They are secreted by hybridomas of cancer cells and B lymphocytes. This is incorrect, it's not secreted by B lymphocyte. The process of making a monoclonal antibody is when plasma cells, releasing a specific type of antibody, is fused with myeloma or cancer cells by a fusogen. Then it forms a hybridoma cell. Monoclonal antibodies are only secreted by hybridoma cells. So in this case, this is incorrect. So the only correct answer here is going to be A. It is correctly described lymphocytes. One, each B lymphocyte has the ability to make several types of antibody molecule. This is actually incorrect because each B lymphocyte has the DNA coding for one specific antibody only and has the B cell receptors only for one antibody. So they can never make several types. So this is incorrect. Two, some B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes become memory cells. In this case, this is correct. When clonal expansion and selection, or the primary immune response happens, then memory cells are formed. If the pathogen is encountered again, the person does not get ill. 3. Plasma cells secrete antibodies into the blood plasma. This is correct. Plasma cells is what secretes antibodies when the colonal expansion of B lymphocytes takes place. 4. Some T lymphocytes stimulate macrophages to kill infected cells. This is also correct. The reason for this is T helper lymphocytes secrete some proteins called cytokines which activates macrophages. So 2, 3 and 4 is correct and the answer is going to be D introduced a measles vaccination during a measles epidemic. Later, it was realized that vaccinated children were more likely to survive childhood than unvaccinated children, even when there were no measles epidemics. The vaccine had given the children some protection against other pathogenic infections. Treatment could account for this extra protection. A. B lymphocytes produce memory cells which gave children passive immunity to these infections. Passive immunity here is incorrect because vaccination is always going to be artificial active immunity. So this is incorrect. B. Memory cells produced plasma cells which secreted anti-measles antibodies that bound to antigens that closely resemble measles antigen. This is correct because here it says it gave other protection against other pathogenic infections. So this is correct. Why? Because the antibodies are kind of similar to other pathogenic infections. C. Memory cells produce plasma cells which secreted anti-measles antibodies that bound to any antigen. As we mentioned earlier, we know that antibodies are specific, so they cannot bind to just any antigen, so this is incorrect. D. T lymphocytes produce memory cells, which gave children natural immunity against other infections. In this case, 
other infections is not really specific. So the only correct answer is going to be B. Thank you very much for watching this video and if you think this channel is useful, I'd really appreciate it if you would subscribe and like this video.